Larry, good to have you back. Good morning. Good morning, Carl. Thank you. Are you going to China, and what do you want to come home with? I am going to China, and hard to know about coming home, but these are serious negotiations. The president has asked us to go over there. As you know, we have a lot of uh, disputes uh, with China, unfair trading practices, illegal trading practices, technology-related uh, issues, and technology theft. They've got barriers and tariffs. We'd like to have them lower them. We'd like to have some market openings. Um, better to have a talk, a one-on-one -on -one discussion, if you will, although there'll be several Chinese officials. I have high hopes for this. You know me. I'm always the optimist about this. President Trump expressed some optimism the other day at the press conference with uh, President Macron. So we'll see, Carl. We'll see. It's going to cover a broad area. All the disputes will be discussed. Uh, will there be a readout uh, upon your return? And how much, if anything, did Tim Cook add to that conversation in the meeting yesterday? Well, I didn't know what you mean by the readout. I mean, we'll, we'll try to brief everybody when we get back, uh, tell them what we can. Tim Cook was most helpful. I really enjoyed the meeting. I spent a good amount of time with him. And then I came back and uh, we visited POTUS. Uh, he has a lot of experience in China, obviously. Uh, he was very helpful in making some suggestions. And I might also add, he loves the tax cut and tax reform. He says it's great for business. And uh, Apple is going to be building plants, campuses, uh, adding jobs, lots of business investment. That was the first point he made to President Trump. Anyway, I enjoyed meeting Mr. Cook. It was a great pleasure. Larry, Jim Cramer, first time on air. I'm able to congratulate you. I think that you were well suited for the job, and it's just great to see you be there. Just watch. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Jimmy. I appreciate it very much. You know that. Okay, now we've got a key deadline, May 1st. John Ferriol, the CEO of Nucor, was on uh, Mad Money recently. He is saying that he would be extremely disappointed if the president doesn't fulfill his commitment about steel and aluminum all the way around the globe. But wouldn't that be difficult to do, particularly given the fact that we just had Macron here, we've got EU uh, concerns. Is the president gonna, going to, uh, where's he going May 1st, Larry? Where's he going? Well, okay, thank you. Um, right now, all that is under discussion. You're referring to the 232 national security um, tariffs, 10% uh, aluminum, 25% exactly. uh, steel. Uh, there were exclusions, as you know, a number of countries, uh, Canada, Mexico, uh, Europe, um, Argentina, Brazil, if I have all of them, I probably don't, Australia, I don't want to leave anybody out. But it's all under consideration now. Uh, we will know in a few days uh, how this thing, part of this is a negotiation, Jimmy. It's very important that some of our friends make some concessions with respect to um, trading practices, tariffs and taxes. I mean, for example, one of the issues cropping up is the equal treatment of automobiles. Um, that's no secret. Uh, we'd like to see some concessions uh, from Europe. The president has said that in his, with his recent visit with President Macron. So we are looking at everything. I believe the deadline is Monday at midnight or some such thing. Uh, there's a lot of discussion internally, and we'll let you know as soon as we, um, as soon as we figure it all out. Larry, I worked with you for a long time, and you taught me a, a great number of things. Uh, you taught me how to be a globalist. You taught me that the idea of free trade produces wealth for everyone. Uh, the man you work for is a nationalist, not a free trader. How is it meshing between your historic views of free trade and the president's view that the Chinese have been waging war against us and we have never fought back until now? Well, look, a couple of things. Um, I don't like to segment quite as starkly as you just did, all right? Um, I guess globalist is a dirty word. I don't know. Jimmy, I'm for trading around the world to promote economic growth, okay? There are some of these so-called globalist institutions that I could do without. That's my personal view. You've heard me on this subject before. But I do believe um, the world's uh, prosperity would benefit uh, by a free and open trading system. But here's the key point. I mean, President and I have full agreement on that. Let's take China. The reason we're going over to negotiate with China is, in fact, China has not played by the rules in many, many years. Again, the uh, theft of intellectual property, the forced transfer of technology, a, a wide number of tariffs and non-tariff barriers. This has gone on for a couple decades. The problem here is not President Trump. He's the solution. 
China's the problem. President Trump has said, you know, enough is enough. He's the first president in decades to track this down, uh, really relentlessly, in order, not fair trade, free trade, help the Americas. If you do this right, everyone will benefit if we can settle these issues and open the trading system. But so far, so far, we have not had satisfactory responses from China, improving responses, let me add. That's why we're going over there. But you know, it's just not as clear as globalist versus nationalist. That, that world, that dichotomy doesn't really exist. This is about specifics, Jim. You're a detail guy. You go company by company. We have to go country by country and make sure that there is free trade down the road. But in the meantime, the path to free trade, right, is to end these unfair and illegal trading practices and barriers. And I think that's exactly the right way to go. And I give the president a lot of credit, for heaven's sake. Nobody's wanted to do this before. Fair enough, Larry. Thank you. I'm going to pass over to Sarah. Hey, Larry. It's Sarah. Hi, Sarah. You mentioned the, hello. You mentioned the tax benefit that you talked about with Tim Cook of the lower corporate tax rates. Wanted to ask you about some data we got today. Durable goods, always a good proxy for where businesses are spending. If you take out transportation, they were unchanged last night. If you look at orders for machinery, they actually sank 1.7%. What happened to the idea that, that companies were going to take all of their savings from lower taxes and invest it in their businesses and hire and buy more machinery and in equipment and boost the economy that way? We're not seeing it yet. Yes, you are, Sarah. You just can't focus on you know one month's data. Look. Let's go to factory orders, non-defense capital goods, uh, ex-transportation and so forth. The year-on-year -year trends are very positive. Uh, I glanced at it this morning. I think it's up 8%. That's a very good number. That's for orders and for shipments. If you look in the ISM reports, uh, both manufacturing and uh, services, uh, you see very strong movement in CapEx and related business investment spending. If you look at the GDP reports, they show the same pickup. So I'm afraid I disagree with your interpretation of the data. I like to take a broader view. By the by, uh, Tim Cook laid it out for the president and all of us yesterday how much Apple is expanding and how many other companies he knows that are expanding. So if you want to focus on, on you know, one little toenail number, okay, that's up to you. I no, disagree, no, no. however, I with your analysis. Well, I'm also just wondering if there's any, <laughs> that's fair, Larry, and that's your job. I'm just wondering Nothing changes. If, there's any Nothing changes. <laughs> if there's any impact, though, of the steel and aluminum tariffs, for instance, on the manufacturing sector. We're starting to see rising input costs. It's something we heard from Caterpillar. It's something we heard from PepsiCo this morning. And some uncertainty about even broader tariffs, as the president has threatened, and whether that's weighing on business investment decisions. Well, there has been some upward price movement in those commodities that you mentioned. Um, we'll have to see how that goes. Uh, I, don't, I don't see any spreading negative consequences, Sarah, but uh, I'm alert to it. Uh, we're all looking at that sort of thing. I mean, mind you, this program to try to get us a level playing field, whether it's China or Europe or wherever, but especially uh, China, if you will, this program, over time, hopefully will be negotiated out. The point is, you've heard me say this before, if it's not, then the United States, President Trump will take action. And those actions will include targeted tariffs, targeted tariffs. I think that's the correct thing. Tariffs are not my favorite tool, but I think they're a necessary tool as we move towards fair and freer trade. And let me add one other point here. I don't want to look at this from the dark side. I think if we can Im improve the world's trading system, which is badly in need of reforms, China and elsewhere, this is going to be great for economic growth here in the U.S., there in the other countries, and around the world. My view is China's behavior, which has not been good in key areas, is actually holding back the world economy, and it's holding back the Chinese economy. Anytime you have market opening, Anytime you have uh, investment openings, anytime you have uh, rule of law uh, with respect to technology and elsewhere, those are good things, Sarah. Those are all pro-growth things. You know me. I'm a growth guy. So what I'm saying is we're creating a process. We're in the middle of a process, whether it's the National Security 232 or the trade uh, restrictions on 301. That process may work. 
You know, so far, it's only the 232 tariffs that have been put into place, and we're going to look at those again uh, early next week. The rest of it are just uh, suggestions. They're just suggestions, uh, and we're going in to negotiate those suggestions. So I remain optimistic that in the spirit of world growth, we can do something very positive here. Uh, Larry, it's David. Uh, on that subject, particularly to China, clearly with the uh, uh, recognizing the negotiations are fluid, Nonetheless, you have to go in, I would think, with what is a clearly defined notion of what would constitute victory. Can you share with us at all some sense as to what would be a victorious um, agreement with the Chinese? Well, I, I don't want to be too definitive because we haven't started the negotiations. But, 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 there's no question that the U.S. government has got to see some progress and improvement by China on some of these key issues, the technology issues, the tariff and non-tariff barrier issues, for example. They have to play by the rules. I don't want to be specific. And by the way, President Xi, uh, a couple of weeks back, made a very conciliatory speech. And President Trump embraced that uh, in a tweet. And here we are going to China to try to negotiate. But David, to, to make this thing work and to be taken seriously, there has to be some very important specific signs on key issues, whether it's, you know, technology and or tariffs, what have you, to give us hope that we can move forward. Look, I worked for Ronald Reagan a very long time ago. As you recall, he coined the phrase, trust but verify. So I think that's the spirit. It's a positive spirit we're going there, but you have to be tough. We're representing American interests here. Larry, we hope you'll come back and give us an update on the other side. Safe travels. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. Hey there. Thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.